Let me just start off by saying, the reason I stayed employed so long even after the first weird thing that happened was because the job paid well over minimum wage and it was about a 10 minute drive from my house. So, before anyone asks, that's why I didn't up and quit. I worked at a large hotel in a medium sized city in the Midwest. Where isn't important. I got the job right out of high school and it was perfect for me. Good pay, close to home, easy as hell. And I did my research on the hotel. It wasn't built on any ancient burial grounds, and from what I could tell no one had ever died there. I didn't experience anything remotely weird until the third floor renovations started. I had kind of a jack of all trades position at the hotel, meaning I did a lot of different things. I cleaned rooms, worked the front desk, delivered room service orders, sometimes even did lifeguard duty at the pool. Once the shit started happening, it happened all over, and me being in the position I was, I saw more than any other employee did. Believe what you want, but the events I am about to recount were all too real for me. I wish I were just being creative. I got to my night shift at 8pm on a Tuesday. Being that it was in the middle of the week, we had about half of our regular occupancy. By no means an empty hotel, but just generally less hustle was needed than say a Friday or Saturday night. The first few hours of my shift went as they normally did. I checked for any incoming reservations due to arrive that night, of which there were two. The kitchen closed at 10, so I only had to run up one room service order, which I ended up getting a $10 tip from, so that was nice. I was getting ready to settle in at the front desk when the phone rang. I looked and noticed it was from a room. Our new phone system had a digital display showing us what room was calling us, and this call said it was coming from room 323. Immediately I was suspicious, as remodeling had started on the third floor about two weeks prior. I answered the phone. Front desk, this is Nick. How may I help you? There was a cough on the other end. I repeated myself. Oh, oh, sorry. How are you? Replied a young woman's voice. I'm doing fine. And yourself? Well, not too good, actually. She said with a hint of worry in her voice. I'm sorry to hear that. Is there anything in particular I can help you with? I'm not sure. Maybe. My regular script I had followed had made me forget where the call came from. I finally inquired. Can I ask where you're calling from, ma'am? I'm in room 323. And you're right. I need help. I had never suggested she needed help. But okay. Ma'am, room 323 is currently unavailable due to the third floor renovation. Are you sure that's where you are? What's your name? I need help, Nick. Right now. I don't think I was supposed to come up here, she said with a sense of dread I could feel through the phone. Now I got it. She had wandered up to the third floor and somehow gotten lost. How could she do that is beyond me. There's signs everywhere. She went into room 323 and used the phone to call. Okay, what's wrong? And what's your name, miss? I asked. I can't get out. The door won't open. It needs to open. Confused and slightly irritated by her not answering my question, I cut to the chase. Your name, miss? She hesitated. Marion Ken... Kennedy, she sputtered out. One moment, please. I said, already halfway through my check into the current occupants list in the computer system. No, Marion Kennedy. Okay, Miss Kennedy, I'm not finding you here. Are you here with someone else who your room may be under? And what room were you initially in? I need help. Please come to room 323 and help me. Please, she said, noticeably more calm than before, almost as if she was annoyed to still be on the phone with me. Miss Kent is all I managed to get out before the line clicked and I realized I'd been hung up on. What the fuck? I muttered to myself. I set a be back in five sign on the front counter and made my way up to the third floor. I reached the hallway that room 323 sat in and as soon as I crossed the threshold into it I was overcome with a feeling of panic. The hair stood up on my neck. Now apprehensive to move forward, I looked around me. There was equipment and materials strewn about 
and a large sheet of plastic covering most of the wall and doors on the left-hand side. I could hear the faint sound of music coming from down the hall. Room 323 would be somewhere in the middle. I slowly made my way down the hall, illuminated by only two light bulbs at each end, darkness meeting at the center of the hallway. As I got closer, the music got louder. It was 1920s style music, like it was being played on a phonograph. As I got closer to the darkness, I noticed a dark red light emanating from under one of the doors. I'm sure you can guess which one. I stood in front of room 323, essentially shaking due to the sense of uneasiness I had. I listened closely, trying to hear over the music for anything else. Miss... Miss Kennedy? I choked out from my dry throat. No response. Just as I was about to turn around and get away, I heard a voice from the other side. Come on in, said a cheery male voice. The calmness in his voice proved soothing, and I became ever so slightly more comfortable with the situation. Miss Kennedy called down to the front desk saying she needed help with something? She's in the bathroom right now. Why don't you come on in here and we'll get to the bottom of it, the man said. I hesitated. Come on in, boy. We don't bite, he said, and let out a small chuckle. He kept on chuckling as I used my master key to unlock the electric lock. I turned the knob slowly, still scared half to death. As I inched the door open, his chuckle turned into a full-blown maniacal laugh as the red light from the room began to flood into the darkness. Suddenly, the laughing and the music stopped as if it had all been one noise abruptly cut off. I will never forget the small moment of silence I stood in. It enveloped me in fear. I stood there motionless until I heard a faint whisper from not one, but two voices. Just a little bit further. That was it. I sprinted full speed down the hallway back the way I came, ran down the stairs, and back to the front desk. I immediately called the police. They got there and went up to check room 323 and found nothing but the renovation equipment related to the work being done in that room at that time. No music player, no people, and nothing that could have given off a red glow. On top of that, there was no evidence that anyone had been in there, workers included, in quite a while, as evidenced by a buildup of dust. And if that weren't enough, there was no phone in the room. They said to call back if I had any more trouble and I apologized for wasting their time. They were cool cops though, told me their job was my safety, and reiterated to call them back if anything else weird went on. I walked them out the front doors of the hotel and walked back to the front desk. On it was a return envelope for room keys people give back at checkout, marked 323. On the back of the envelope was a short survey. They marked one for poor for each line and included a short note on the provided lines below. Maybe next time. I never dealt with anything quite like that again, but I do have some other really scary shit to tell you about the hotel I worked at. Maybe I'll even tell you why I eventually quit. Chapter 2 This one probably left me the most unnerved of anything that happened. It happened some months after the first story I posted with a few minor incidences in the interim. It was a Saturday night. I remember this distinctly because of the amount of incoming and outgoing guests we see on this particular night of the week is directly related to what happened. Me and another employee were working the front desk, taking the incoming reservations. There were people around the lobby chatting, either coming back from or on their way out to the next bar. It was about 1 a.m., so people realized they had an hour to do their livers as much damage as possible until they returned to the hotel for the night. I don't blame them for going elsewhere to drink, since our bar was woefully overpriced. Even so, our bar was at about 75% capacity. Anyways, I got done with my guest at the desk and noticed there was no longer anyone waiting as my coworker had just started taking care of another guest. I walked to the room behind the front desk to get something to drink and to check my phone out of the line of sight of guests lingering in the lobby. We play music which is broadcast through speakers throughout the hotel, including the room I was in. It comes from a playlist on a computer whose only purpose is to fill the hallways and lobby with elevator music. Being that it came from the computer, 
I was slightly taken back when static came through the speakers. I listened for a moment as a hint of white noise hissed through the speakers, then completely cut off. I checked the computer, which was working just fine, and showed the current song as playing as it should be. So I checked the cord which led to the receiver. All was fine there as well. I decided the problem was out of my control and ventured to return to the front desk. But as I opened the door, a sudden wave of deafening silence flooded over me. It actually startled me. I opened the door all the way and stopped dead in my tracks. I had been in the room for no longer than 20 seconds, and apparently, in that time, each and every of the probably 20 plus people in the lobby, including my coworker, had vanished. I felt a drip of cold sweat run down my back. I gazed across the lobby to the bar, only to find it deserted as well. All I could hear during this time was the sound of my own heart beating. There had to be some kind of a rational explanation for this. I ventured out into the lobby, each step echoing through the high ceilings. I knocked on a random room door, got no response. Another, no response. Just for shits and giggles, I checked the second floor as well. I heard a door creak at the end of the hallway. I assumed it was open as I didn't hear it close, so I trudged down to the end of the hall, and as I got there, the door to room 202 clicked shut. I politely knocked on the door and got no response. I pounded on the door harder and yelled, Hello? Finally, I used my master key to unlock the door and burst in. In hindsight, probably not the smartest idea, considering I had no idea what awaited me on the other side. I was met by nothing. The same ear-shattering silence as before continued to plague me. I checked the main room and the bathroom and found no one. I exited the room, struggling to make sense of what was going on around me. Then, that horrible silence was broken by the familiar ding of the elevators. I looked up and to my right at the numbers above the door, which told me that this particular elevator trip had originated on the floor above me. It was coming down, and once I noticed it go past the second floor, I rushed downstairs to try to meet whoever it was to see if they had any idea of what the hell was going on. I made it to the first floor and waited a cautious distance from the elevator. For what felt like an eternity, I nervously tapped my foot on the ground. Then, the elevator door opened. There was nothing. No one was inside the elevator. This thoroughly scared the bejesus out of me, and I ran to the room behind the front desk. I gathered my belongings as quickly as I could and prepared to leave the hotel. I felt disoriented from the sheer silence that filled the walls I so desperately did not want to be trapped in. As soon as I turned the door handle to exit the room, a cascade of noise hit me like a ton of bricks. The music, the chatter of patrons in the lobby, my coworker's voice informing the guests he was helping about our breakfast hours. Everything was back to normal. It was as if what had just happened hadn't happened at all. I stood there, frozen until my coworker turned to me. You okay? He said. I couldn't bring myself to speak. Are you leaving or something? He inquired, noticing my coat on my arm. His tone told me he was on the brink of annoyance, pending my answer to his question. I snapped out of it. Oh, uh, no. I just, I... I offered no real explanation before I turned around and went back into the room. I set my coat down, took a deep breath, and walked back out. I noticed a new guest had just entered the queue behind the ones my coworker was currently assisting. I pressed my shirt down and stepped up to the computer. Welcome. I'm Nick. What can I do for you? At this point in my tenure at the Whitmore Hotel, I was very cautious. Nothing directly dangerous had happened to me yet, so I had no reason to believe I was in any danger. I have always been a believer in the paranormal. 
so the fact that there were strange things happening didn't necessarily cause a deep-rooted worry in me, so much as it caused some definite standalone frights. I had avoided the third floor of the hotel as much as I possibly could, since the event I wrote about as well as a few other smaller instances had occurred. If assistance was needed on the third floor, I generally handed off the responsibility to one of my co-workers without explaining why. No one else had ever had any bad experiences up there, so they didn't question it too much, aside from assuming I was being lazy. But sure enough, something happened when I was alone on a night shift, and I got a call from the third floor. It was a Wednesday night, about 2 a.m. I was sitting back, relaxing behind the front desk, when a call came in. Room 325. I answered the phone while simultaneously checking the computer to make sure someone was in fact staying in that particular room that night. All checked out. The man asked for more towels to be left outside his door. I set the voicemail message stating I would be back in 10 minutes or less and set out a sign saying the same. I went to the storage area and grabbed a handful of towels. I made my way up to the third floor and knew exactly where room 325 was, considering its close proximity to the room that had been ever present in nightmares past. I apprehensively strolled down the hall, which, although now properly lit, still gave me a feeling of uneasiness. Nonetheless, I set the towels on the floor, knocked twice on the door, and made my way back down the hall. I turned around for whatever reason, and the towels were gone. No door opening and closing. Nothing. I chalked it up to me just not hearing it, and went about my night. About five minutes after I got back to the desk, I got another call. This time, it was the dreaded room 323. I let it ring through because I knew for a fact that no one was in that room tonight. The phone never went to voicemail. It must have rang 30 times before a sickening mix of anxiety and curiosity got the best of me and I answered the phone. I didn't say anything. Hello? Said the voice on the other side. Since it sounded like a normal voice and nothing otherworldly as I had convinced myself it would, I entertained the notion that this might be something rationally explainable. Uh, hi, this is Nick at the front desk. How may I? I was cut off. I asked for more towels. Yes, sir. I dropped more towels outside the room 325 just a few minutes ago. I replied. When I say I need more towels, I don't mean I need a towel or two grabbed off the nearest rack. I mean I need a bunch of fucking towels. The man's gravely voice roared at me. Okay, sir. Cut off once again and leave them in front of the right room this time. The line clicked, indicating I'd just been hung up on. This call more so confused than frightened me. So many questions were raised. Did the previous call really come from 323 and I just absentmindedly didn't notice? Who grabbed the towels from 325? He implied he'd gotten the few from in front of 325, but I know in the time I left them there and looked back, he couldn't have gotten them from 323 and back in time without me at least hearing the one step it would take to get there, much less the door opening and closing. I checked the computer log for room 323 and it showed the room was empty. I was once again on high alert. I resolved to leave the towels outside room 325 again so I didn't have to stand in front of 323 for even a split second. I would deal with the potentially angry guest again, if need be. I made my way to the third floor, and as I walked down, nothing was amiss. I set the abundance of towels down in front of room 325, and the moment they touched the carpet, the lights went out. Not all of them, mind you. Just every light between the light at either end of the hall. I was frozen in panic. A million situations raced through my mind, before I snapped out of it. As I turned to run, every light in the hallway swelled to an impossible brightness. 
in a blinding flash that left me disoriented. All I really recall is that I ran backwards down the hall, weary of whatever might exit room 323 to devour me or whatever would happen. One thing stuck out in my mind though, and that was that the towels were already gone. I sprinted back to the front desk, where luckily there was a walk-in guest who made casual conversation and took my mind off of things, if only for a few minutes. Once they were on their way to their room, I snapped right back to it. I don't know at what point it happened, but something clicked in my mind. I hastily ran my fingers along the clacking keyboard and checked the room log for 325. It was being occupied by a Mario Kennedy. The name stuck out like a sore thumb. Before I could figure out what to do with the information, the phone rang. Luckily, it was from room 225, so I wouldn't have to make my way back to that damned third floor hallway. Unfortunately, they were complaining about a strange noise coming from above them. I told them I would call the room and ask them to keep it down. I figured I can't be harmed through a phone call, right? I dialed room 325 and was met with an answer before the first ring even began. It was a woman. Hello? Yes, hi. This is the front desk. The guests in the room below you just called to complain about a strange noise coming from above them, which would be your room. This is just a courtesy call to please ask you to resolve whatever is causing the excess noise. Oh, of course, replied the oddly chipper young woman, whose voice I know I'd heard before. Thank you. And the line clicked. These people really didn't like saying goodbye. The next hour or so went by without incident. I got up to go to the bathroom, and when I came back, there were two guest checkout envelopes. One from room 323, the other room 325. Neither had any comments written down, but every critique had been marked for four, which was satisfactory. I wrestled with the idea of going up to see if it looked as if no one had been in the rooms for what felt like an eternity before something inside me said it was safe. I ventured my way up, making sure all the lights were on first. I got to room 325, still unsure if I had the guts to go into 323. What I was hoping for did not come true. The moment I opened the door, red emanated from the room, but not like it did from 323. This was blood. I only opened the door a few inches, and all I could see was red all over everything. That was enough for me. I sprinted back to the desk and immediately called the police. They arrived and went up to room 325. They checked it, and surprise, surprise, they found nothing. Then, they checked 323 and found the vast number of towels in the bathtub, soaking wet. Finally, some evidence that someone had been in there. They checked the camera footage, but it never showed me taking up the towels in the first place. I once again apologized, which was met with positive reactions from the once again understanding police. I sat back down at the computer, where I had just tried to show the police the Mario Kennedy reservation, which of course wasn't there. I moved the mouse from the screensaver, and there it was, a picture of room 325, covered in blood. In the corner of the room stood a young man and woman, covered head to toe in blood. All I could discern from the flood of red around them was their impossibly bright eyes and teeth. They had hideous grins on their faces. I quickly closed the horrifying picture. I looked up from the desk to find the two of them standing there, covered in blood, grinning and breathing heavily. I blacked out. Next thing I know, I was being cared for by EMTs. I asked what happened and one of the police officers said, as he was walking back in to get my signature on the statement I had just made, that I stood frozen at the desk for about 10 seconds and then fainted. I have no recollection of that whatsoever. 
This was the first instance that truly rattled me to my core. I was hesitant to keep working there, so I compromised. I took a week vacation, during which time not one strange thing happened to me. I figured I was getting stressed from working so many night shifts, with some day shifts thrown in there as if to make for certain I wouldn't get a proper amount of sleep. I did, however, spend this week digging much deeper into the Whitmore Hotel than I did at the beginning of my employment. I will share what I found in the next update. So, there I was with more time on my hands than I had had in quite some time, as I took what I believed to be a well-deserved week-long break from the Hotel Whitmore. I filled my time by catching up on sleep, binge-watching The Wire, aka the greatest television drama ever created, and most importantly, doing some deep research on the Whitmore. I did some basic Google searches and didn't really find anything noteworthy. I pretty much got lists of celebrities or other important people who have lodged there in the past, and a basic history of the hotel. The Whitmore Hotel was built from 1930 to 1931 during the development of the entire area in which it's located. The owners were actually a group of men, each of whom funded different aspects of the project, and was named after one of their associates who had passed during the planning phase. I did individual research on each of these men, and nothing really jumped out at me. They just seemed like normal, opportunistic businessmen. When it opened, it was bigger and better than any other hotel in the Midwest. It featured nine floors, an elaborate bar off the lobby, over which hung a lavish chandelier. Certain changes have been made since, including multiple weight rooms and a very, very large indoor pool area. In addition to the added amenities, the rooms have also been remodeled more than once. Over the past decade or so, the hotel's business has slowly dwindled with chain hotels such as the Holiday Inn Express, La Quinta, and Days Inn, among others sprouting up new franchise locations. Most of the guests now come for the fact that when they leave, they get to say they spent the night in a historic hotel somewhere multiple presidents have stayed during their time in office. I personally have stayed a few nights, and I might add I never had anything strange happen when I did. After reading all this, I was pretty underwhelmed, as I'm sure you are, so thank you for bearing with me. I stopped to watch more TV, but something was bothering me. I went back to research the names of the gentlemen who funded the hotel, and found one common theme. They all got their start with a now defunct, as of 1996, investment company called The Kennedy Conglomerate. Now we were getting somewhere. I looked up the Kennedy conglomerate and found a basic history which I won't bore you with, besides the fact that it was located on the west coast. What was interesting about the Kennedy conglomerate was the fact that in its last years of functioning, it was ran by the original owner's grandson, Mario Kennedy. Researching Mario Kennedy gave me a lot of insight to what I was dealing with. Now. Much of what I read were second and third hand accounts of rumors, so I don't know if what I read was true or not. However, if it were true, it would certainly give credence to what was going on around me. Mario Kennedy was a playboy of sorts. He had all the money in the world and nothing responsible to do with it. He funded several businesses, most of which failed. He spent his money on drugs, women, alcohol, cars, properties which he would let go to ruin, then one day, he met Marion. Supposedly, the day he met Marion was the day he stopped indulging in his numerous vices. He gave everything up cold turkey. They married the same day they met, and Mario and Marion spent the next few weeks in the tropics, without telling anyone where they went. When they got back, everything with the business was a mess. Mario did the most selfish thing he could and liquidated the company, leaving his entire staff to fend for themselves. He and Marion now had nothing to get in the way of their relationship. This gets really interesting when I read that Marion was part of what you could call a cult called the Congregation of His Infernal Divinity. It was a religion that didn't necessarily worship Satan so much as it did demons. Demons of all kinds. This church was supposedly home to some of the younger elite in the state of California, and one aspect of their modus operandi was the kidnapping and sacrificing of children. 
Without going into too much detail, I will say that the accounts I read were revolting. Again, I'm taking it all with a grain of salt, but let me continue. Marion brought Mario into this group of sick human beings, and he apparently fit right in. They had a ritualistic induction ceremony in which he stalked a nine-year-old boy, abducted him from his home in the middle of the night, and slaughtered him at one of the cult's temples. Allegedly, Mario rose up the ranks of the CHID with his wife riding his coattails. However, his previously flamboyant and eccentric lifestyle seeped back through the barriers he had put up, and he got sloppy. Word got out about the congregation of his infernal divinity, and they were eventually shut down. Members were arrested and tried, most of whom received the death penalty, all except two members, Mario and Marion Kennedy. In a cross-country manhunt, they were finally cornered in the state I'm in at none other than the Whitmore Hotel. They supposedly kidnapped a child from another family staying in the hotel, murdered him in their room, covered the room and themselves in the child's blood, and each committed suicide in the year 1996. It didn't say which room this allegedly happened in, but I don't think it'd be too hard to guess. Despite all this rich Kennedy history, there has never been one single complaint or allegation that the Whitmore is or ever was haunted. Like I said, the initial search I did on the place when I started working there gave me nothing. There were no ghost stories, no spectral sightings, nothing. And as someone asked in the comments, no, no other employees were reporting anything strange happening. At this point, I thought I was going crazy, but at the same time, the things I'd been experiencing had been so real, so convincing, and on top of that, I've always been of sound mental health. I have no history of schizophrenia or delusions of any kind. I felt as if this was happening to me specifically, and for a reason. When I went back to the hotel the following week, I decided I was going to tough it out and figure out just what the fuck was happening and why it was happening to me. My next experience with room 323 gave me some answers, and looking back, I honestly wish I never would have found them. But before that happened, I went back to the Whitmore for my first shift back from my vacation. It was a day shift on a Thursday, where I was to be the lifeguard for the indoor pool area. The girl who was to be the other lifeguard called in sick and the only other person who had undergone lifeguard training started his vacation the day I got back from mine. We were severely understaffed. So I sat in my perch and basically just hung out for the first five hours. Around 1 p.m., I suddenly got very tired out of nowhere. I had gotten so much sleep the week prior that staying up for a day shift would have been nothing, but fatigue hit me like a slap in the face. My eyelids felt almost as heavy as my head, which I was lowering by the second. I suddenly jolted awake, like when you fall asleep in class and pop up and look around to make sure no one saw, and what I saw was burned into my brain. Every guest in the pool area was floating face down in the pool, moving ever so slowly by some unknown current. I observed that every body was perfectly still, no flailing or struggling to swim, and on top of that, some of the bodies looked bloated, as if they'd been there a while. I climbed down from my perch, completely taken back at what I was witnessing. Had all these people drowned once I fell asleep? That made absolutely no sense. I know I wasn't in a deep sleep, certainly not a deep enough sleep for close to 20 people to die without me fucking noticing. It wasn't until I took a few steps along the side of the pool that I noticed that same deafening silence as the vanishing episode from chapter 2. As soon as I noticed, I became disoriented. I stumbled a bit, but caught myself before I tumbled into the pool. It was then that I noticed something. A woman wearing all black was crouched in the far corner diagonally across the pool from me, laughing hysterically, yet very quietly, just quiet enough to break the uncomfortable silence. I attempted to yell over to her, but I couldn't hear my own voice. Her stifled, terrifying laughter was the only sound that existed in my currently abhorrent consciousness. I felt a tap on my shoulder. I spun around and was standing about an inch away from a man. I only saw him for a brief, brief moment, but I saw that he was wearing all black, and he was definitely the same man I'd seen first standing in the corner of the room in the picture of room 325, and then standing in front of me at the front desk where I blacked out from the events of chapter 3. 
I unequivocally knew it was him from the impossibly wide, bright teethed grin that covered his lower face. It startled me to my core, and I instinctively stepped back, falling into the watery grave that was now the Whitmore Pool. I struggled to get to the surface, but it was as if the bodies had all drifted toward me the moment I hit the water, trapping me underneath them. I flailed aimlessly under the water, the light closing in on me as I felt my last breaths escaping my lungs. It was then that I snapped back awake. I looked around, now wide awake, and everyone was as they were the moment my eyes all but forced themselves shut. Children were playing in the shallow end. Adults were horse playing in the deep end below my feet. I looked to the far corner where the woman had been laughing, and there was no one. I would have chalked this instance up to a terrifying dream if it weren't for the fact that I was inexplicably soaking wet from head to toe. Until next time, Nick. The pool incident was very unnerving for me. There was no logical explanation for my being soaking wet when I hadn't been in the water. I took an inventory of all the things that had happened so far. There was the red light emanating from room 323, the vanishing episode, the towel picture fainting incident, and now the pool event. Those coupled with the few minor happenings I mentioned in chapter 4 had let me know one thing. I had not yet been attacked or directly harmed in any way. Even with the pool, in my dream, I guess you'd call it, Mario Kennedy didn't push me. He simply startled me, which in turn caused me to fall backwards into the water. Neither he nor the woman, who I was assuming to be Marion Kennedy, had ever physically touched me. I should also clear up something. I didn't directly ask any of my coworkers if they had been experiencing any strange things regarding room 323, the third floor, or the hotel in general, for the sake of not wanting to come off as crazy. Instead, I chose to keep an open ear and see if anyone mentioned something. I did not, and when I delegated certain responsibilities unto other employees which required them to venture to the third floor, I was met with no opposition or apprehension. So I believe myself to be the only one being affected by whatever it is that's going on here. That said, I decided I was going to figure out what was going on. I know, horror movie cliché, head towards the danger. My only explanation for this is once it's actually happening to you, it's almost impossible to not want to get to the bottom of it. I knew what was happening, but I wanted. I needed to know why it was happening. So, with that, I waited until the following Monday's night shift. The weekend was fairly uneventful, save for a few doors closing by themselves and computers restarting. I told the day staff to not book rooms on the third floor unless absolutely necessary so as to shield any and all others from any harm that might come from my endeavors. So Monday night, I had just finished sending an incoming guest to the second floor for the night. It was just after 2 a.m. After the bar emptied out, I said farewell to the bartender and set my back soon placard on the front desk. I made my way up to the third floor. I exited the staircase. I have always had an irrational fear of elevators and that's why you may have noticed I have never mentioned taking it anywhere, and headed to the hallway that contained room 323. As soon as I turned the corner, all lights between the two at the ends of the hall went out, as they usually did whenever I entered the vicinity. Also true to form, my consciousness seemed to now be void of all sound. Only a fear-inducing silence surrounded me. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I was so fucking scared. It took quite literally everything I had to try to unravel this mystery that had presented itself to me. I took a deep breath with each slow step I took down the dimly lit hall, with each pace taking me further into the darkness. As I reached room 327, all the symptoms of fear hit me like a freight train. Cold sweats flooded down my back. The hairs on the back of my neck and my arms stood at attention as if commanded by a drill sergeant. My breathing turned shallow as if the air had suddenly become thinner, like I was standing at the top of a tall mountain. My mind was bombarded with possible scenarios, as I had literally no idea what I was walking into. I was now standing in front of room 325. I hesitated walking any further until I looked behind me and found only a solid wall about three feet behind me, decorated with the same paint pattern as the rest of the hallway. I was at, much to my dismay, the point of no return. I turned back around and found another solid wall in front of me, 
just inches past the door to the dreaded room 323. Faced with the revelation that I had no choice now, I resolved to continue onward. I only had a few feet left to go, but every centimeter felt like a mile. I lifted my right foot off the ground to take a step while I heard the door creak open. Doors in the Whitmore don't creak, so in hindsight, I feel as if this small effect was added simply to scare me more. I decided that since I was in this no matter what at this point, I took three long steps and confronted room 323. The red glow I saw the first time I had an experience with the room was back, and if you'll remember, it was definitely from a light and was not blood as was the case with room 325 in chapter 3. The red light spilled out into the dark hallway and I could feel heat drifting out of the room. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and nudged the door open. I don't know what I was expecting. I half thought I was going to be dragged into the room and be gruesomely murdered by some ghost, demon, hellspawn, baby killer, cult assholes, and half thought I was going to pass out from a fear and adrenaline overdose. I opened my eyes and saw that the bulb in the lamp that illuminated the room was red. I took a careful step inside and saw nothing. And no one. You know how you get that feeling that someone is around you even before you know it? Well, I didn't have that feeling. I very slowly and nimbly made my way into the room. A dated set of women's clothes were draped neatly over the chair in the corner of the room, and a very nice, very expensive looking men's suit was hanging up atop the slightly ajar bedroom door. I looked around the room, and it took me a second to notice that it was different from the rest of the rooms in the hotel. It was styled like it hadn't been changed in 20 years. That would make it 1996. Makes sense. I tiptoed over to the bedroom door, and just as my fingertips grazed the door to lightly push it open, the television in the living room area turned on. A disorienting cacophony of static and white noise assaulted my senses. I quickly got my bearings, and when I did, it was a video recording of the hotel's basement. It looked like it was being recorded on a Super 8 camera. I watched as whoever was holding the camera made their way to the back storage area. The camera focused on a pile of newspapers as if inviting me to examine their contents. Then the television cut off. That feeling I mentioned that you get when someone is near you and you know it before seeing them? I had that now. I spun around and there they were, Mario and Marion Kennedy, standing in front of the now closed door, with the exact opposite of their disgusting grins. Their faces were now home to terrible grimaces, as if they were extremely displeased that I was in their home. As soon as Mario began to move toward me, I threw myself into the bedroom and closed the door behind me. Panicked, I flicked the light switch on, which filled the room with the same red light as the room I had just escaped from. To my surprise, there was another door in the room, not a closet door, as that was to my right, and opened wide with clothing strewn about its floor, but another full-size door, directly in front of me on the wall next to the California king bed that took up most of the rest of the room on the left. Before I had time to react, what I am sure was both Mario and Marion began violently pounding on the door, simultaneous to Marion's crippling laughter. It was as if she was enjoying the dread she knew was instilling in me. I used every bit of energy in my body to run across the room to the other door, but what happened was something straight out of a bad dream in a horror film. The room turned into a hallway, growing longer with every stride I took. The door just out of my reach. I heard the door behind me burst open and turned my head to see Mario and Marion floating, not running, but hovering over the ground as if they were on some sort of track toward me. Now with those indescribable smiles back on their disproportionate visages, gaining on me quickly. I don't know how I did it, or what made it possible, but as I silently begged and pleaded to whatever higher power there is to let me reach the door, I did. Just as the Kennedy couple reached me, I was able to grab the door handle and push it down, opening it into another hotel room. As I tried to leap inside, a scalding hot hand grasped my left wrist. In a fluid motion, I ripped my hand from the grip of who I turned to see was Marion Kennedy and lunged forward. I tumbled in and immediately scrambled to turn around and close and lock the door behind me. I sat with my back to the door as the Kennedys once again beat against it. I took a deep breath and observed my surroundings. I was in room 325. I had completely forgotten that 323 and 325 were connected via a doorway. 
a popular style of room for two families traveling together. Each gets their own room, with the convenience of having an open door between them to enjoy each other's company. Upon this realization, I concluded that I wasn't any safer here than I was in room 323. I had seen this room covered in blood with the Kennedys standing in the corner, so it's not as if this room was uncharted territory for them. You have to realize, I knew next to nothing about what I was up against. I didn't know what they wanted. I didn't know why me. I didn't know the extent of their abilities. I didn't know if they had free reign over the hotel and could go anywhere they pleased, or if they were confined to room 323, 325, and the pool area. All I knew at this moment was that I was without question in a room they could inhabit, and, finally looking at my left wrist, I noticed a light burn in the shape of a hand, which informed me that they could in fact physically hurt me. I did the smart thing and ran for the door to the hallway, silently praying that it wouldn't open up to a solid wall. Luckily, it didn't. I stumbled into the hall, my mind hazed by a vicious cocktail of darkness, silence only broken by the banging on the door in the room behind me, and fear. I ran to the left, towards the light at the end of the hall. Once I made it to the point where the light reached me, I looked back. Mario and Mary and Kennedy were standing outside room 323 next to each other, both smiling and waving. I kept running until I made it down to the lobby. To my surprise, the guest I had checked in about 15 minutes prior was standing at the front desk with all of her luggage, and the bartender was back at the bar, serving patrons a round of shots. I wearily walked behind the front desk and glanced at the clock, which read 1.59 as the woman addressed me. So? She said, visibly annoyed. So? So what? Do you have a room with a balcony open? I don't get why you couldn't just check on your computer. Don't you know which rooms have them? Oh. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I just, look, I don't care. Just get me set up, I'm tired, and I have a lot of work to do tomorrow. I need to get some sleep. How long had I been gone? Why did I tell her I needed to go check on a room with a balcony when she was right? I could have just checked on the computer. I was so confused. Of course, ma'am, my apologies. I went through the process of setting her room up, gave her her keycard to room 239, and sent her on her understandably thankless way. By this time, the patrons in the bar had done their shots and the bartender was putting their glasses in the dishwasher as they headed back to their rooms for the night. He set the dishwasher to clean the contents and turned off the lights in the bar. In a true deja vu experience, we exchanged the same goodbyes as I could have sworn we'd done not 15 minutes earlier. I reflected on what had just happened, the few things I'd learned, and what I needed to do next. I resolved that on my next night shift, which would be the following night, Tuesday into Wednesday, I would go into the basement to find out whatever the television in room 323 was trying to tell me. I figured I had already gone this far. Why stop now? I guess you could say I'm a pretty persistent person. I needed to know why this was happening to me. In all, this entire circumstance boggled my mind. Had I just hallucinated that whole nightmarish ordeal? As with the pool incident, I might have assumed so, were it not for the slightly stinging, hand-shaped burn wound that wrapped around my left wrist. Until tomorrow, when I promise to have answers. The morning after the incident with Mario and Marion, I got off work and went home, where sleep was a non-existent activity in my life. I sat there contemplating about how I should go about the basement, what dangers I would be in, what I might find, etc. At the end of a long personal debate, I decided I was going to hold off on the basement. I didn't want to end up like every first character who dies in a horror movie because they got too brave and decided to go search for the killer. That was the plan anyways, but that changed when I walked into work the following night. I tried to busy myself with work, reading memos left by the day manager that day, going over the reservations books, handling random computer tasks. But as I was doing the computer tasks, something of course happened. The screen once again flashed to the bloody room 325, with the Kennedys standing in the corner smiling. Only this time, it was different. This time, I was in the center of the floor, covered in blood myself. I was laying down, almost in the fetal position, and it did not look in the least bit voluntary. I tried to take a picture of the computer screen with my phone, but the result was just a blur of red. As I looked into the picture trying to find something useful from it, the burn on my wrist started to sting. I looked at it, 
and it had a dull glow to it that I could faintly see through the white bandage wrap I had secured around it. I shook it off. Then I got the idea to print the screen from the computer. I did the proper keystrokes and turned around as the printer kicked into gear. When I turned around, I was face to face with Mario Kennedy. He put his hands on my biceps and his face went from that ghoulish grin to a distorted, misconstrued, mouth open wide scream that threatened to rupture my eardrums. Before I knew it, I was done and I was standing face to face with the bartender who was shaking me by the tops of my shoulders. Hey, stop! I came to. What? what I'm not sure what I was asking. You stood here for like 30 seconds staring into space, then just started screaming at the top of your lungs. You wouldn't snap out of it. Are you okay? You want me to call an ambulance or something? No, no. I'm sorry. I just freaked out for a second. I'm fine. Thank you. You sure? He asked uneasily. Yeah, seriously, yeah. I'm all good. Sorry about that. Thanks for getting me back to the real world. I let out a half-hearted chuckle. The bartender wandered back over to the bar, looking behind him to make sure I was okay. I could see the bar patrons whispering amongst themselves about what had just transpired. I was more than a little embarrassed. I went in the back room and took my shirt off in front of the mirror we had in there. I inspected my arms and shoulders. As I said, I had been grabbed by Mario on my biceps and by the bartender on my shoulders. My shoulders showed no sign of contact, but my biceps had finger-shaped bruises. Better than burns, I figured. It wasn't until later that I'd learned why I got one instead of the other. I grabbed a flashlight from a supply closet and navigated the maze-like hallways on the first floor until I reached the basement door. The door led to a long, three-tier staircase, which in turn led to a vast, unfinished basement. I turned the light on and took my first steps down. Once I reached the first landing, I heard the lock click on its own on the door above me. Fuck. This was starting to look like a bad idea. But, I trudged on. I made it to the second landing, and the lights flickered a few times before going completely out. Fuck again. This really was a stupid idea. I turned on the flashlight I was now congratulating myself on bringing and continued down. The last few stairs creaked and echoed throughout the basement. The air down there was thick and damp. It felt like a weight was pressing down on me, as if gravity worked overtime down here. For a moment, I felt as if the silence I'd come to expect when delving into this mystery had turned itself on, but then realized it hadn't. The basement was just simply that quiet. The only thing I could hear was a furnace on the far back left side of the wide open space. Lining the walls were storage units, some empty, some with random cleaning apparatus, some with winter snow removal machines and shovels, some with old comforters and bed sheets. The one I'd seen in the video recording in room 323 was in the far back right corner. I knew because the angle of the video showed the newspapers in the storage unit to the immediate left of the corner of the large area. I slowly began to trek to where, hopefully, information or answers of some kind would be. Because this hotel had proven time and again to have things uncertain occur at any whim, I took great care with each step. I imagine that the batteries in the flashlight hadn't been changed in years, because honestly, no one ever needed to use it. That being the case, only a small path was illuminated in front of me. Each small step I took echoed between the concrete walls. Every small scrape my feet made sounded like it was amplified, until suddenly, there was no more sound at all. It was happening again. The silence. My desire to know what was in that basement wrestled with my better judgment, until the thirst for knowledge won out. I kept moving forward, then suddenly to my left, in an empty storage locker with the door wide open, was a woman laying face down on the ground. It wasn't Marion, as this woman had brown hair. Marion was blonde. I decided I was just going to ignore it and keep going. I got about two steps past the locker when I turned around. The woman was now behind me, out of the storage closet, in a stance like she was ready to leap. Only, it wasn't a random woman. It was a decaying, decrepit form of my mother. Skin hung off her face like a peeled banana. Blood was caked under her crusted lips. Her eyes were a glassy, foggy white. She sniffed at the air. What the fuck? I absentmindedly said out loud. I knew my mom was at home and fine. I was texting with her shortly before that. 
This had to be an illusion of some kind. Foolishly, I decided to find out. I stood my ground, waiting for her to make her move. She swiped forward at me, and her grotesquely long fingernails ripped through my polo shirt. All right, not an illusion. Good to know. I turned around and sprinted, and when I looked behind me, my mother started to run, but hit some sort of invisible brick wall. I saw as her face contorted like she'd been hit in the face with a frying pan, and she fell to the cold floor. She immediately bounced back up and tried advancing on me, but whatever was in her way held her back. She moved around in what seemed to be an invisible box containing her. I was more than confused. I kept walking, only now picking up the pace. As I passed another empty storage locker, I was hit with a blast of heat that sent me flying to the left. I hit the wall, just barely holding on to the flashlight. The force with which I flew into the wall put me in a daze. My vision was temporarily blurry, but I could clearly make out Mario and Marion floating toward me with their grins. They stopped a few feet short of me, and in the blink of an eye their expressions turned blank. It would be easier for us all if you just let us do what we need to do. I didn't know how to respond. We almost had you in the room yesterday, but you got out. Do you know how angry that made Marion? I looked to Marion, whose face instantly turned to pure rage. We will get you eventually. Make it easier on all of us and come to room 325, so we do what must be done. Enough of these cat and mouse games. I was stunned that I was finally being communicated to instead of arbitrary circumstances just filling my existence. What needs to be done? Why me? I choked out. Mario and Marion both laughed hysterically. Because you're the one, silly. Marion screeched. The fuck do you mean I'm the one? What one? One for what? Words rolled off my tongue rapid fire. Suddenly, Mario and Marion vanished and the minimal sound the basement produced came back to life. I had no clue what was going on. They were gone. My zombie mom was gone. Sound was normal, and I didn't have the slightest clue why. I checked my phone and saw that time was moving as it should be. No more momentary lapses in time and space, so that was good at least. I looked at the tear in my shirt, and it was indeed still present. I was still sweating from the waves of hot air that accompanied the Kennedys. This had all actually just happened. I got to my feet and dusted myself off. I was finally going to make it to the corner of the basement. I wasted no time and rushed to the first storage container to the left of the corner. In it was a stack of newspapers, just like the television in room 323 had showed. Next to the stack of papers was a note that read, These stay here, please. From what I could tell, the newspapers were from 1926, 1930, and 1996. Let me break down the information I found in them. This won't be verbatim as I didn't exactly have the capability of copying all the information down at a time. 1926 Enoch Phelps, investment banker, arrested for connection to kidnapping. What I gathered from this was that Enoch Phelps was an original member of the Kennedy conglomerate. He, along with Wilson Kennedy, George Wilhelm, and Marco Esperanza, founded the congregation of his infernal divinity. Basically, it was a name that they could be psychopaths under. A reason to kidnap children and sacrifice them to whatever the fuck it was they believed in. So, in 1926, someone tipped off the authorities about the location of some missing kids. They were directed to a place owned by a female friend of Enoch Phelps. She gave up Enoch, and he was arrested for connection to the kidnapping. Further articles explain that he was tried and convicted, and received 15 years for his crimes although he would die in prison due to respiratory failure. 1930 Arthur Whitmore missing. Arthur Whitmore pronounced dead after months of no leads. That's two separate articles, by the way. Here's where the big revelation came, sort of. Arthur Whitmore disappeared in the fall of 1930 during the planning phase of the as-yet-unnamed Whitmore Hotel. There was foul play suspected, as he had his whole life on the West Coast. He was a happy man, looking forward to his further involvement in this large project. After spending months and countless resources trying to locate him, he was pronounced dead after nothing but the last suit jacket he ever wore was found in the Rocky Mountains. His colleagues decided to name the hotel they were building after him in his honor. What stuck out to me was the following. 
Arthur Whitmore leaves behind his expecting wife, Elaine Whitmore, in parentheses, Botic. Hold the goddamn phone. Elaine Botic? That was my mother's name. I pondered on this for a moment until I remembered that she got her name from her great-grandmother. Arthur Whitmore was my great-great-grandfather. After his death, Elaine went on to marry another man after having my great-grandmother, and the marriage didn't last, and she reverted back to her maiden name. None of the women on my mother's side of the family had ever married. It was very taboo for some of the times. So I was born a Botic. I now knew what my connection to this hotel was, and perhaps why I was being targeted. I just didn't know what was to be accomplished by my going to room 323. 1996 gruesome scene at Whitmore Hotel. One child, two suspects found dead in room in apparent ritual murder slash suicide. This explained the story of Mario and Marion Kennedy. I honestly didn't get much help from this article, but it was good to know what was fact and what was just internet hearsay. What was helpful was what I found underneath the newspapers, a box full of yellow legal paper pads with seemingly incoherent scribblings in red ink. I flipped through trying to make sense of anything and just couldn't until I realized the first three pages were some sort of codes. Unfortunately, I never found out what those codes meant. I'll say that right now. After the third page, however, it was a detailed list of all the goings-on at the Congregation of His Infernal Divinity. Pages upon pages of information about murders, their rituals, their victims, their locations, their influence on businesses way back when. All the information stopped at 1996. Check back tomorrow. I will be including everything I learned about the Congregation of His Infernal Divinity and how it pertains to the Whitmore Hotel, my family, and me. Just a forewarning, this is where shit gets really, really weird. I sat in the basement looking at these yellow legal pads of paper that seemed to give me all the information on the congregation of his infernal divinity that one could ever desire. I will do my best to relay this information to you to the best of my memory, and before you ask, I tried taking pictures. They turned out just like the one I took of the computer screen, a blur of whatever was the primary color in the picture, in this case, yellow. The original idea of the congregation of his infernal divinity was conceived by an eccentric member of the original generation of the Kennedy conglomerate before it was formed, Wilson Kennedy, together with his friends Marco Esperanza, Enoch Phelps, and George Wilhelm Kennedy held a meeting at a lavish supper club, the Benedict. Here, he proposed the scriptures of the Bible they would follow. Kennedy chose to worship the offspring, birthed through a process of mixing of the blood of the demons Klonek, Fursalor, Moloch, Kronos, and Barbas, named Ruzel. Klonek was the demon that could grant great power and wealth. Fursalor was the patron of rage and murder. Malak, who was in particular one of the worst and most feared demons, was the leader of Hell's army and demanded the lives of innocents, in particular children. Kronos, who controlled time and space, and finally Barbas, the demon of fear. The result from mixing of their blood, birthed through a virgin child, was Ruzel. Ruzel was a demon of pure evil, pure mayhem. He promised great wealth to his followers, but demanded the blood of innocent children as retribution. Anyone who faltered in their abilities to perform their duties to him would be dealt with in the most horrific of ways. Wilson Kennedy summoned this demon through a process that involved him getting the demon to appear and speaking to him through a mirror, offering and negotiating terms. It was decided that Kennedy would be granted great riches in exchange for the blood of a child and the recruitment of another for the same purpose and same reward. More fortune required more children and more recruits. Kennedy then regaled to his colleagues of how Ruzel came to be and how he came to such great wealth, much to their amazement and disbelief. He invited them to summon Ruzel themselves in individual summonings that took place over the next week each giving Wilson Kennedy the proper credit for his recommendation. Ruzel told each of the men the same terms he gave Kennedy, 
which each of the men graciously accepted. In another meeting held a few days after the summonings were all complete, the men decided to form the Kennedy Conglomerate as a place to house all of Ruzel's followers under the guise of legitimate business persons, while all were truly members of the congregation of his infernal divinity. Each man found a close friend or colleague as a recruit, and the recruits did the same. When they were at a proper age to fulfill the agreement between themselves and Ruzel, the original members of the church brought in their children, and so the cult grew, generation after generation. One of these business associates was Arthur Whitmore, a close friend and colleague of Enoch Phelps, one of the original members of the CHID, Kennedy Conglomerate. Calm and mild-mannered, Arthur Whitmore reluctantly accepted a vague invitation to some sort of an induction ceremony. What he saw boggled his mind. The ceremony was described in detail, almost as if it was taking minutes on a business meeting, and this log was accompanied by some grainy Polaroid pictures to better help illustrate the words. Wayne Cousins Induction Ceremony Apparently, each member who was getting inducted had to describe how they went about capturing the child they were going to sacrifice for their penance to Ruzel. Wayne Cousins began stalking the nine-year-old niece of his mistress. He took two weeks off work to learn her every move. When not covertly spying on her, he would encourage his mistress to spend time with her sister's family, where he could get an up-close look at what would be his first victim. After this two weeks, he went to the sister's home just before dark incapacitated the sister and her husband, and knocked the nine-year-old unconscious. He carried her limp body to his vehicle and drove off into the night, headed for a predetermined safe house to store the child until they were ready to be transported to the church. The church, I learned, was an underground compound about a half mile from the Kennedy conglomerate headquarters, accessible only from a tunnel that ran between the two domiciles. It was a large underground complex that had a massive ballroom in the center of which the ceremonies were held. Once at that church, one would stand at some place in the three rows of pews. Then, from behind a closed door, a bodyguard of some sort brought out the child, immediately closing the door behind them. He walks the blindfolded child to the head of the stage, which the door lies. In this stage, there was a metal platform with hundreds of small holes decorated with skirts. Underneath the platform was a sliding container, which I learned was for collecting blood, and underneath that was a fire pit. On a self-standing wall to the right of the platform was an array of blades. The child was then admired by the crowd from the pews before having a white sheet draped over them and finally laid down on the platform with their wrists and ankles bound to the short post that adorned the end of the tabletop-like surface. The original members of the congregation of his infernal divinity then entered from the same door the child and bodyguard came from, adorned in black and red hooded robes. Two of the four men stood on each side of the platform and chanted something, which was responded to by the crowd. I can't recall what the exact back and forth was. After this, Wayne Cousins exited the back room, wearing a blue hooded robe. There was a series of questions asked and answered between the four Kennedy conglomerate members and Wayne Cousins. Wayne Francis Cousins, do you, after all, accept the terms set forth by Ruzel? Yes, I do. Do you believe Ruzel to have abided to his end of the deal you came to? Yes, I do. Are you prepared to offer your penance to Ruzel in exchange for his generosity? Yes, I do. Do you accept that any failure to fulfill your duties to Ruzel will result in Ruzel exerting his most heinous force of retribution upon you? Yes, I do. Then without further ado, please commence with the offering. Wayne walked over to the wall and chose his blade. It was a long, thin knife that curved at the end with a serrated edge. The child squirmed underneath the white sheet, struggling to get out of the ties around her hands and feet. Wayne dragged the edge of the knife over the sheet from her feet to her forehead. He brought the blade back to her torso and held it there momentarily before slowly sliding it through the sheet and into her body. According to the logs, the young girl's screams filled the ballroom more so than any other victim had before. The stain of blood slowly grew on the white sheet 
as the girl screamed and writhed in pain. Wayne took the knife out of the girl and began viciously stabbing her repeatedly up and down her body and in her face and neck. After some time, the girl died from her injuries. Wayne took a bow and returned to the head of the platform, handing the bodyguard his knife, who in turn wiped it clean with a rag and returned it to the wall. They chanted some more things I can't remember, and Wayne then removed the sliding container full of blood. It was like a mixing bowl that sat on a track. Wilson Kennedy then spoke. We now offer the body and blood of this beautiful, innocent child in the name of Wayne Francis Cousins to the almighty Ruzel. The four other men around the podium joined him in speaking. As he giveth to us, so shall we give it to him in return. Kennedy lit a match and tossed it onto the presumably pre-soaked wood underneath the platform, and the flames roared up, engulfing the girl's lifeless body. As the fire burned, the crowd joined the five men on the stage in a chant. Once the body and sheet were burned and charred, and the flame died down a bit, Wayne poured the blood, first over the body, to stifle the flames that remained on top of the covered corpse. The platform was then slid from over the fire pit and the remaining blood was distributed amongst the pit to extinguish the flames. After this, everyone cheered and congratulated Wayne with a flurry of handshakes and hugs, except for, as it was noted, Arthur Whitmore. The papers referred to him as a conniving cunt, god-worshipping pussy, traitorous scum, among other things. I then read on about what happened with Arthur Whitmore. Apparently, he went along under a charade that he was very interested in becoming a part of the congregation of his infernal divinity. He performed the summoning ritual under the watchful eye of his sponsor, Enoch Phelps, and was taken through a rehearsal sacrificial ceremony. He was told he had one month to abduct and deliver his chosen victim to a location that would be given to him on the night he planned to do the kidnapping. He spent the next three weeks giving made-up details about a young boy he was stalking. He told a fictional account of the boy's schedule, what the parents seemed like, what the boy enjoyed playing with, all the information that one might obtain through a clandestine surveillance. It was the first day of the last week he had to kidnap his victim. He had since been to two other sacrificial ceremonies, as attending any and all of them was expected by a prospective member of the congregation. It was the ceremony held this night that must have sent him over the edge. The victim was a newborn boy. The sponsee was a woman who had waited for her neighbor to give birth, and on the night the new mother returned home from the hospital, snuck into her neighbor's house and took her newborn son. Arthur watched in horror as this small child was brutally murdered and burned before him. He told Enoch Phelps that tonight was the night he was going to kidnap his victim. Enoch told him to go home and wait by the phone while he found out which safe house he was going to be expected to drop the victim off at. Arthur sped home and waited by his telephone with a piece of paper and a pen. He received his call shortly after getting home and got the address. He immediately called the sheriff's department and reported that abducted children were being held at the address he was given. Six children were found being held captive at the house of Ruth Hammond, a mistress of Enoch Phelps. Ruth folded under the pressure and revealed her lover's involvement in the scheme. In the trial that ensued, Phelps was sentenced to 15 years for kidnapping. Ruth Hammond received eight years for her part in the plot. Through the information given by Arthur Whitmore, they found the church but found no remains of any sacrificed children, nor any evidence that any murders had even taken place. Even though the church and the rest of the congregation was safe from prosecution, inferred to be by virtue of powerful connections, the blame was almost immediately assigned to Arthur. Not long after the trial ended, he vanished without a trace. What I read after this gave me so much insight as to exactly what it was I was dealing with. Arthur Whitmore was taken by private train car to the Midwest by the original members of the CHID and some loyal followers. Somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, the group stopped and tortured Arthur, leaving his suit jacket behind. A monogrammed handkerchief was found in the breast pocket, 
thus revealing its owner. They traveled to the land they had recently purchased that was to be the site of the hotel. At that point, just a large open field. They summoned Ruzel to be present during the death of the man who had summoned and then blatantly forsaken him, depriving him of countless sacrifices. Ruzel then put a curse on his bloodline, damning every male descendant he had. Ruzel explained that no man had ever summoned him, then forsaken him before bringing him a sacrifice or recruit, and that this was an important event. The curse he laid on Arthur Whitmore meant that with each subsequent death of his descendants, Ruzel could walk the earth for one day. It was insinuated that the amount of damage Ruzel could do in one day could be catastrophic. The opportunity for demons to walk amongst man was apparently highly coveted. Ruzel then declared that one day, a chosen one would become a part of the congregation. He would grant this person the privilege of remaining on earth into the afterlife with one purpose. It was then that he prophesied that a Whitmore would one day step foot onto this land where his ancestor was sacrificed. When this happened, the spirit of the chosen one was to sacrifice the descendant of Whitmore, thus granting Ruzel the opportunity to walk the earth for one day. I read further. After the police shut down the safe house, the church ceased operations for some time, save for the sacrifice of Arthur Whitmore. Years later, it was brought back to prominence by the sons of the original members of the Kennedy conglomerate, and so it went through the generations. Over the years, countless children were kidnapped and murdered. So as not to arouse suspicion, members looking for victims for their first sacrifice would spend weeks at a time in other states, choosing their victims from places that had no connection to where they regularly laid their heads at night. One man that didn't care to join the congregation was Mario Kennedy. He had everything he wanted in life already. He had no need to summon a demon for wealth or power. That is, until he met Marion Masterson. Marion was brought into the church by her mother. It was at her summoning that Ruzel proclaimed her to be the chosen one. He told Marion she would one day find a lover who would bow to her every whim and together the two would bring the church to new heights. As you know, this wasn't the case. The lover she found was Mario, and Mario became so enthralled with murdering children that he eventually led to the exposing and subsequent downfall of the congregation of his infernal divinity. Ruzel was not pleased with this. He threatened to condemn Mario to hell and he would have if Marion had not pleaded with him to allow him to stay with her on earth after they died. So Mario would have a chance to make amends to Ruzel by helping with the sacrifice of the Whitmore descendant. Ruzel agreed. Word amongst the now imprisoned members of the congregation was that Ruzel and the Kennedys had gone into a hibernation of sorts, only to be awoken when the Whitmore descendant stepped foot on the land. That was the end of the pads of paper. I was so confused. I stood up, too fast as it were, and I got dizzy. I closed my eyes for a moment. I opened them to find myself in the middle of a large field. I was frozen in fear. I heard the crunching of cold grass behind me and I spun around. A man I'd never seen stood before me. Were it not for me, all of your colleagues in the hotel would make fast meals for Ruzel. What? Do you not find it strange that not another one soul can see things you've seen? Well, yeah, I... I have been in the hotel for a long time, Nicholas. Who are you? Arthur Whitmore. I didn't know what to say. Just a week and a half ago, I'd never seen a ghost and now I was in the middle of a goddamn child sacrificing heir to the worst possible throne, ghost, cult, demon, conspiracy. What is the point of all this? Obviously to not die so the demon can't walk the earth. But what if I just leave the hotel? Can they follow me? The Kennedys and Ruzel have been dormant for the last 20 years. That much time down, it takes time to reach the power they once had. Their interactions with you have increased in severity over time, have they not? They had. Once they reach full power, the Kennedys will have free reign. Through my efforts, I have contained them to the hotel. 
and made it so their influence can only be felt by you and no one else. Soon they will be able to freely move about the world and kill again, something they have not done for two decades and will be eager to partake in. They will stop at nothing to appease Ruzel, and that means they will never stop hunting you. You must stop them. And how might I go about that? I asked. Halfway tempted to just kill myself since I was going to definitely die soon anyways. Better a bullet in the brain than getting stabbed and have my body burned and doused with my own blood, right? You must arm yourself with holy relics and sacrifice Mario and Marion Kennedy. Offering his own demons to him will show him you are a worthy adversary and he will abandon his quest for your blood. He will wait in hell to be summoned again and find a new avenue through which to walk the earth. So, get a bunch of crosses and shit and what? Walk into room 323 and 325 and what? Scream the power of Christ compels you and they'll just lay down and be like, time to get stabbed? It may not be as difficult as you presume. I blinked and I was suddenly back in the basement. The papers were gone. I was so unbelievably confused. I wasn't a demon slayer. I was a goddamn float position worker at a failing historical hotel. I thought back to my job application. I'm relatively, not positively, but relatively sure that this was not in my job description. I thought back on my life. Nothing even nearing a fraction of this complexity and adventure had ever been bestowed upon me. I thought about it and decided I was going to see this through to the end. I was going to heed the advice of my ancestor and save countless people from dying horrible deaths. I was going to confront Mario and Marion Kennedy. The Final Chapter I went to a religious supply store the next morning and bought myself the most aggressive looking crucifixes I could find. I bought three rosaries to hang around my neck. I bought a Bible. I even went and had a priest bless some water for me. To tell you the truth, I had no idea what I was doing. I suppose my plan was to burst into room 323, throw some holy water on the two psycho baby killer demons that wanted my blood to wake a sleeping super demon and try to subdue them by hitting them with a Bible and poking them with crucifixes? Trust me, at the time, it felt as stupid as it sounds here. I got to work on Thursday night and relieved the day shift employee. I sat around for a while with my religious paraphernalia on my person, trying to muster up the courage to go to room 323. Shortly after the bartender left, the lights dimmed. All sound escaped the room. It was time. I knew it. And they knew it. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen now. I walked up the stairs to the third floor and made my way to the infamous hallway. The two lights at the end of the hall shone bright as the apex as if to remind me where to go. I walked down and reached room 325. The door creaked open on its own, letting the red light seep into the hallway. There was a metal table with skirts in the middle of the room, above a small pit, with a container on a track underneath the tabletop. The same type of platform from the Polaroids that accompanied the ever-informative legal pads. That was what they hoped to have me laying on in due time. I continued walking to room 323. The door was closed. I used my master key to unlock the electronic lock and push the handle down. I hesitated before pushing the door open. Everything in me was telling me to turn around and run, and run, and don't stop running. But I knew if I did that, this would never end. I would be hunted until I was caught. I would just be delaying the inevitable. I inched the door open. I didn't realize I had been looking down toward the floor until I redirected my eyes up and found Mario standing at the crack in the door with a violently angry grimace adorning his face. The door flew open, yet Mario stood in the same place, almost as if the door simply passed through him, not too far-fetched, I'd say, given everything. Mario breathed deeply and heavily, his chest heaving with every inhale. The anger in his eyes was mesmerizing. I managed to break my gaze and look past him, to see Marion posing in a curtsy in the back of the room, smiling her fearsome grin. I'm not sure which face frightened me more at the time. I hadn't realized it, but I was holding up my three rosaries that hung from my neck in front of me, and to my surprise, it seemed to keep Mario at bay. Suddenly, he spoke. Do you not understand what your destiny is? I do, 
I'm just not exactly okay with getting fucking stabbed and burned and having blood poured all over me, I said with far more confidence than I previously thought to have had. No matter what you do, you can't stop this. So do it, I spoke without thinking. I immediately thought, why the hell would I taunt a demon? To my relief, Mario didn't move. He just glared at me. I began to speak. You, I was cut off. Not like interrupted, but like my voice stopped working. Everything warped around me. Walls caved in, then bubbled out. Sounds erupted from no discernible source, interrupted only by random bouts of complete silence, which proved to be equally as deafening. Lights flared and dimmed simultaneously, blinding me and offering me comfort at the same time. I blacked out. When I came to, I was laying in the middle of the floor in room 325. I was awoken by something dripping on my face. Before I was fully coherent, I used my finger to check what it was. It was blood. I looked up. Hanging over me was a rudimentary canopy made out of a wooden frame that hadn't been in the room when I looked in earlier. Hanging from this canopy was a body. Each arm and leg was tied by a sheet to a corner of the wooden frame, then mass of the body sagging lowering than the rest, intestines and other vital organs hanging halfway out of the gash in the victim's back. It was when I came fully to that I recognized the clothing the body was wearing. It was the bartender. Fuck. I had been responsible for his death. Maybe not directly, but I hadn't acted fast enough. Fuck. Shame and regret coursed through my veins like a hit of heroin, momentarily paralyzing me with guilt. I couldn't stop to feel sorry for myself, though. I sat up and saw the Kennedy standing in the corner of the room. I reached to my neck for the rosaries, but grabbed at nothing but air. They were gone. Marion held up the rosaries and laughed with her signature cackling howl. The crucifix I bought was resting on the Bible, which sat atop a small table next to the Kennedys. Well, there goes that plan. Blood surrounded the floor around me. I was next to the metal platform. I used it to pull myself up from the floor, nearly slipping on the red coat of coagulating liquid that slicked the carpet below me. In an instant, Marion was face to face with me. So long it seems that we've been waiting for this. I didn't know how to respond. I felt helpless. I felt I was in the final moments of my life. Subconsciously, I resolved all the internal conflicts that weighed heavily inside me. I silently made amends to those I'd wronged in life and regretted certain past decisions I'd made. I raised a hand to wipe away a tear from my eye. As my hand descended back from my face to my side, it brushed against my pocket. I just barely felt the small tube of holy water I had placed there moments before walking down the hallway. While Marion talked, staring intently into my eyes, I, with all the grace I could summon, removed the tube from my pocket and twisted off the cap. On the top was a screen, so one could flick the wrist and sprinkle holy water out like they do in Catholic church services. I truly hope you know how great of a service you're doing. Ruzel will be so grateful for your sacrifice. The blood of so many will proudly spill in the future because of your blood spilling today. Shall we begin the... Right here is where a CSI, Miami, or Bruce Campbell-esque one-liner would have fit like a puzzle piece. A list of them ran through my head. Sacrifice this. I'd rather spill some holy water. You look like you could use a shower. But this isn't a movie, and I'm not a shitty actor, so instead, I said absolutely nothing. I raised my arm and shook the tube, which sprinkled holy water onto Marion. Instead of scalding her skin, which is what I'd been led to believe what would happen by years of exorcism movies, she flew back against the walls if hit by a wrecking ball. I quickly composed myself and tossed holy water at the already advancing Mario, sending him back with the same force as his twisted lover. I looked at them, and they were both incapacitated. All I could think was, wow. How incredibly, ridiculously easy. What did I even have to be scared about? I felt like the man. Now I had to sacrifice them. I needed to show this fucked up demon that I wasn't the one to tussle with. Apparently. I kept the holy water clutched between my thumb and index finger as I dragged Marion's body to the platform. It took some elbow grease. The full weight of a lifeless demon ghost is not much different from that of a living person. I retrieved a bedsheet from the closet while keeping an eye on Mario, who laid in the corner. 
unconscious. I placed the sheet over Marion's body. The door to the room creaked open. I readied the holy water and found myself in a state of instant panic. Much to my relief, Arthur Whitmore entered the room. You will need someone to conduct the ceremonial interview and necessary chance. That will be my duty. He then extended his hand, in it a long blade with a thick handle. I took it from him and stood at the head of the platform, all the while keeping my peripheral vision focused on Mario. Nicholas Jacob Botic, do you offer this soul in the name of the infernal Ruzel? I do. Do you intend to enter into a sacred truce with Ruzel? I do. Do you agree to abide by his order for fear of eternal damnation? I do. I sputtered out, not knowing what I was agreeing to. Everything was happening so fast. I didn't even give myself any time to listen to what was being said to me. It's only in retrospect that I'm able to relay these words to you. Then, without further ado, please commence with the offering. I took the blade and, without hesitation, repeatedly stabbed at the covered body of Marion Kennedy. Blood soaked through the white sheet that cloaked her body, the blade going clear through her to the hold metal surface on which she laid. I heard blood drip through the holes into the bowl underneath. I stabbed until I felt as if my arm was going to fall off. All the while, Marion was completely and utterly silent. She didn't move an inch. I don't know if she was unconscious through it all, or if she was just tough as any woman ghost could be. I didn't really care. Arthur Whitmore simply stood and admired what I was doing. He motioned for me to continue on with Mario, whose body I laid halfway on top of his now thoroughly filleted lover. I repeated the process, thrusting the long blade into him, twisting and turning it as I retrieved it from his body. By the time I was done, I was out of breath. Now, it was time to burn the bodies. My first thought was, how am I going to have a bonfire in a hotel room without having this whole place go up in flames? Arthur spoke as if he could read my thoughts. Do not worry. The flames will fall into themselves. These spirits will burn hotter than any other earthly flame. It will be more of a contained burn than a roaring fire. Who was I to argue logic? Nothing else here made sense. Why would this? Arthur handed me a pack of matches after I was finished stuffing the bodies into the small pit. Don't forget to retrieve the blood, Arthur reminded me. I slid the bowl of demon blood off the tracks and set it on the tabletop behind me. An odor I hadn't noticed before marinated in the room, stinging my nostrils. I imagine it was the stench of a rotting corpse. I looked at the bodies of the Kennedys and noticed they were decomposing at an alarming rate. I took this as a sign that I must make haste. I struck a match and dropped it into the pit. As the fire erupted, flames shot high to the ceiling, then subsided, and just as Whitmore had said, the flames burned only an inch over the bodies, engulfing them and the table on which they rested completely, but kept the rest of the room safe. The smell of burning flesh permeated the air, nearly making me gag. Arthur and I stood there in silence and just watched. As the fire began to subside, Arthur nodded towards the bowl of blood. I retrieved the bowl and took it to the platform. I poured a bit over the smoldering bodies, which by this point were nearly bones, and even those were turning to ash. I then slid the table over and poured the rest of the contents of the bowl onto the fire pit, extinguishing the flames. I had done it. I had sacrificed two demons to a more dangerous demon. I looked to Arthur, only he looked different. He had a grin on his face, like Marion and Mario would have. A disgusting, wide, toothy grin. Thank you, Arthur muttered through his teeth. For what? I asked uneasily. There was an immediate palpable tension in the air. Arthur laughed a cackling howl. For fulfilling your duties, they were going to be able to give me one day on the earth. You. You give me countless days. I tried wrapping my mind around what was happening. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, he said. I, he took a bow, am Ruzel. Fear ravaged through my body, making me feel more sick to my stomach than I already had from the smell of rotting bodies. I watched as Arthur's skin began to fall off his face. The demon ripped the clothes from his body as his true form became clear. 
He was a hideous monster with three horns. His feet were hooves. His hands looked more like bird talons, and his skin was jet black. His eyes were like pure white, large marbles. His teeth were sharp and jagged, crooked, and in rows in his mouth. He swiped his right hoof twice. He opened his deformed mouth and let out a loud roar. That is the last thing I remember of that night. I woke up, back at the front desk. I don't know why, but something compelled me to quit right then and there. Now I know. I suppose I owe it to you guys to explain what exactly happened. When I quit the hotel, I went straight home. I took a shower. After that, I went to my sister's house to visit her newborn son. I took mental notes and figured out when would be the best time for me to kidnap my nephew in order to sacrifice him. You see, Mario and Marion were confined to the hotel. They were ghosts or ghost demons whatever. But me, I had access to another male from the Whitmore bloodline. I could create more males from the Whitmore bloodline. Ruzel masqueraded as Arthur Whitmore. He can appear as a ghost if need be, but he can't directly harm humans unless he is walking the earth in human form. As Arthur, he had me learn the summoning rituals and had me summon him to me personally. That way, he was connected to me. Then, he had me perform a sacrifice. He knew I wouldn't sacrifice a human, so he had Mario and Marion be my victims under the ruse that it would stop Ruzel from hunting me. In reality, sacrificing a demon to Ruzel only makes him stronger. Oh, and I learned that the holy water didn't do anything. Ruzel just led me to believe it had. In reality, he threw them against the wall hard enough to knock them unconscious. Ruzel explained to me that I was indeed the Chosen One. Through the mistake of summoning and forsaking Ruzel before performing a sacrifice, Arthur Whitmore had opened a door. As I explained earlier, that door was the opportunity to walk the earth by sacrificing the males from his bloodline. I was just unlucky enough to be the first boy born in a few generations. Since I was able to be found at the Whitmore as prophesized by Ruzel, I was the easiest target. I could create more male descendants to the Whitmore bloodline. I now spend my days in seclusion. I stalk and hunt victims. I impregnate as many women as I can, be it through consensual relations or not. Usually not. And I wait. I wait until the sperm fertilizes the egg and I sacrifice the woman in a ritual. Sometimes it would have been a boy. Sometimes it's not. Either way, Ruzel is pleased. He thoroughly enjoys the days he gets to walk on Earth. These can be recognized as any days that include a larger than normal death toll somewhere in the world. Obviously not every case, but certainly the more sinister instances. I do this because I was shown hell, and I do not want to go there again. I have to do this until it's my time. If I do, Ruzel promised I wouldn't have to go back there. He said there's another place I can go. I don't really know if I believe him, but it's the only thing that keeps me going. That, that maybe, after all this, something will be better. I'm sorry if this isn't the ending you were looking for. It's just, this is my life now. I intended to tell my story completely and accurately, and this is it. It's time for me to go now. I've been watching a woman on Fuller Street for a few days now, and it seems pretty easy. So I guess I'm gonna go do it. Goodbye. Nick. <laughs>